Excellent. Hopefully we're good. Anybody see or hear me? Well, I think we are live. Let's see here. It says we're live. Excellent. Yeah. Beautiful. Let's see who's the first to show up. Cloudy Sprite, how are you doing? Welcome to Paleontologizing. <laughs> welcome, welcome everybody. It is uh, maybe windier than I would like right now, but can't win them all. Welcome back. Streaming live from the field right now out in western Wyoming. See our Ceratopsian site behind me right here. And, uh,. This is the landscape that we're working on. I know I keep showing this, but it's just beautiful, and it's such a privilege to be able to do this. Here is our remote setup here. Yeah. Uh, streaming off the grid. Yes, indeed. Uh, I didn't, I failed to bring my wrist strap for my phone today, so I'll have to go like this. But hello to you, Magsmus. Uh, Moondrop Soup, Dragon Fairy, Zorox. How are you all doing? Wonderful to have you here. And uh, and holy cow, bloody mad cow, thank you for resubscribing. I appreciate that very, very much. Yeah. And uh, Cloudy Sprite, type an exclamation mark Discord. That's the command for that. So, uh, yeah. And a singular B, how are you doing? Welcome back. Good to see you. Yeah. All right, excellent. I'll just wait a few minutes for some more people to trickle in, get some moderators in here, and uh, yeah, then we'll go ahead and get this thing started. Uh, it's going to be a fairly low-key stream today, but we'll pr be probably doing some more jacketing, and I'll show you the jacket that we've made for this uh, this horned dinosaur, this ceratopsian. Yeah. Iconic Song says, nice hat. Thank you. I've had this hat for 16 years now at this point. Favorite hat. Yeah. Tarzan says, hello, you are literally living my dream right now. Well, Tarzan, I'm glad I can share it with you then. Welcome. It's great to have you here. Yeah. Uh, and someone called Ragnarokker, how are you doing? Welcome back. Good to see you. Brannington, what's shaking with you? Maximum Darnage, thank you for the 12 months of support. You know, I appreciate that. Welcome back. Yeah. And, uh, and Dinosaur Dave, how are you doing? It's great to have you here. Thank you, thank you for showing up. Um, yeah, yeah. It's already Monday for you, isn't it, Dinosaur Dave, down there in Straya? Um, yeah, it is almost a year maximum, darn it. Yes, indeed. All right, we'll just wait a few more minutes for some people to trickle in, and uh, yeah, then I'll go show you what's kicking off at the Ceratopsian site. Yeah. Oh, congratulations, Brannington. Good for you. Very nice. Yeah, excellent. Well, well, well. Uh, and yes, Sunday Dinosaurs, Oscar Jr. You know, every day's a work day out here in the field. You work while you can, and you take a break when it rains, or whatever else. Um, so yeah, yeah. Uh, and Elias, I'm glad you're here too. How are you doing? Pookie, what's shaking? Welcome to you also. Yeah. So there's the crew up there, working on... The Ceratopsian jacket. We were able to get that flipped just a little while ago. So they're thinning down the underside. I'll explain what all this means to those of you who aren't in the know about that. I'll explain it in a few minutes. So we're species of Ceratopsian. This thing's new. New, new, new. Uh, yeah. Pretty exciting being able to work on what will probably become a holotype specimen. So yeah, and what part did we find? The best part, a uh, uh, some parts of the frill, parietal mostly it looks like. Which if you're gonna find one part of a ceratopsian, you want the parietal. So we've been extraordinarily lucky. Uh, Nick Longrich found this a few days ago. He's kind of uh, joined our crew for a little while. He doesn't get to do much field work during his uh, his regular job back in uh, in England. So yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> His first day out prospecting, finds the Ceratopsian. That's pretty incredible. Yeah, 
but uh, yeah. And 5280, Andy, thank you. Appreciate that. Yeah. Um, and there you go, weird adult. We're not doing that. Yeah, not going to run over the Starlink with the jacket. We'll probably get the jacket out today. That's might be ambitious, but uh, we'll try and get it into the truck and back to camp tonight. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, anyway. Um, mini Lego fossil build for him. He might like that a lot, actually. Yeah. Uh, Brow, how are you doing? Welcome, welcome, Brow. Good to see you. Yeah. Man, how long does it take this thing to update? It still says 23 viewers. I think, I suspect we've got more than that right now. Yeah. Hopefully those clouds will not dump rain on us either. I'm going to have to end the stream. Or at least shelter under a tarp or something. But we'll see. It's all part of being out here in the wilderness. So, uh, yeah, yeah. Glad everybody's here. It's going to be a fun little stream today. Uh, Drake on Alpha, how are you doing? Welcome, welcome. Haraz. Magsmith says, is there any wildlife there? Absolutely there is, yeah. I've seen some birds of prey. I've seen a bunch of lizards. We saw a gopher snake yesterday, which was really cool. Uh, we got pronghorns down there in the valley. Um, and, of course, we see evidence of all kinds of wildlife. Lots of scats. Coyote scats. It almost looked like a mountain lion scat. Deer and elk. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, and satellites seem to be working so far, Relo Rolo. Yeah. We saw a big train of them the other night, actually. It was it's honestly kind of spooky to just see a bunch of very, very bright lights moving like a like a freight train across the sky. But yeah, any interesting tracks? None yet, really, Dinosaur Dave. Just a couple of deer and elk tracks I've seen. Found some dead sheep and some dead deer over there, too. Like skeletons, I don't know how many years old, um, down by the road. Yeah. And there you go, Jerez, yeah. A few, a few primates as well, you know, of the paleontological, paleontologist persuasion. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. Bert Waffle, how are you doing? Welcome, welcome. Good to have you here. Yeah. Good stuff. Yeah. So, again, little introduction. If anybody's here for the first time, welcome. My name is Danny Anduza. I'm a dinosaur paleontologist, uh, and I'm out here in Western Wyoming doing what I do during the summers, digging dinosaurs. So here we're near the town of Green River, Wyoming, kind of out in the middle of nowhere, as you can well see. And uh, yeah, we're digging up a Ceratopsian dinosaur right now, a horned dinosaur. Uh, not too dissimilar from Triceratops. This one looks like it's probably a Chasmosaurine, we think. Um, makes sense from what we found so far. And uh, there it is up there, in that big white thing. That is not a gigantic egg or anything. That is a fossil jacket, and I'll be kind of walking you through that in a little bit. Um, so yeah, yeah. I'll see you later, Dino, Dinosaur Dave. Thanks for being here. Yeah. But uh, anyway, yeah, good stuff. So we're here in the Late Cretaceous Almond Formation. So maybe you've heard of the Hell Creek Formation, or the Morrison Formation, or maybe the Lance Formation here in Wyoming. The Almond Formation doesn't get nearly as much attention. Hardly anybody's ever worked in the Almond Formation. We're at about 73 million years old here in these rocks, uh, from kind of the shores of the Western Interior Seaway, when there was a shallow tropical sea that cut through the central, uh, the center of the continent of North America, kind of cut the continent in two. So we are basically on the east coast of the western subcontinent here. So these would be like, you know, near shore environments. It's terrestrial, but uh, yeah, be like deltaic environments. So like deltas, rivers, lakes, streams, that kind of thing. Just right there on the edge of the continent before you get to that, that shallow warm sea in the middle. So all kinds of different dinosaurs were living and dying through here and uh, leaving their bones for us to find. The cool thing about the almond formation is that it's so understudied, and so just about anything that we find in here is gonna be new, including this dinosaur, probably gonna be new. It'd honestly be very surprising if it were not new, because this is a slice of time and, and place, geographically and uh, temporally, 
this is all going to be new. So it should be a whole different group of dinosaurs that uh, uh, that nobody's ever found before. So yeah, yeah. Anyway, good to see everybody. Yeah. What do we think would be close in comparison to Tarzan? That's hard to say. It might be kind of like Anchiceratops. But again, don't quote me on that. We don't know. We won't know until we get this thing into the laboratory, but uh, and you know, get it cleaned and studied. But yeah, yeah. Um, could be kind of like a Rhinoceratops. Could be kind of like Pentaceratops. We'll find out. But whatever it is, it's big. It seems really big. The frill is really, really thick. It's a large animal, which is exciting. Uh, so yeah, yeah. Anyway, you want to go up there and uh, and check it out? Let's go see it. All right. So of course, here's our streaming setup here. There's the Starlink dish, solar generator, and then here's the quarry itself. Uh, hey, everybody. How's it going? <laughs> going well. How are you guys doing? Just gonna dust well, off the jacket, make it ready for TV here, make it look pretty. <laughs> nice and pretty. Yeah. I'm ready for my close-up, Mr. DeVille. Exactly. <laughs> How's Very nice. You got that thinned down beautifully. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's so clean in there, too. Nicely yeah, done. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. A clean site is a happy site. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, you guys want to introduce yourselves real quick? Yeah. Uh, I'm Dr. Nick Longridge. I'm a senior lecturer in evolutionary biology and paleontology at the University of Bath. Yeah. Terrence Cook, just here helping out. Nice. Seth Cook, also a volunteer here. Yeah, we've got two brothers here. Awesome. <laughs> we got down pretty far into here and we started getting to do a lot of roots, so we slowed down here and then nice. this uh, different colored element came in, so we yeah, gave a pause there. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, it's, it might not be the bone, it might just be kind of like an iron oxide rind over uh -huh. the bone, but we just like, we hit that and we're going to kind of, not really much point in going too much further. Uh, you know, just, we've got most of the weight out here and as far as exposing the bone, that's probably best done in the prep lab. Uh -huh. So, uh, we've kind of done what we need to do here to get this thing light enough to move. Very nice. Uh, it's so much thinner, and I'm sure it's so much lighter than yeah, it was yeah, before. Yeah. Holy cow. Yeah. Do we want to... I could walk, walk you through a, a spiel of the whole up to, up to now. Yeah, let's uh, do it. Uh, yeah, so I mean, some people have probably heard this before, and some people are probably tuning in for the first time, but uh, this is a site, I, I, as I explained, it's kind of like a... It's sort of a textbook site, uh, and it's gone... Everything is done the way it should, in a way that it rarely actually does. Yeah. So just kind of walking along, looking around, found a few scraps of bone, found a, a, a dense, uh, a, a fair amount of float on the surface, indicating something was weathering out. We followed up the hill. We found a great big piece of uh, what, it, what appeared to be ceratopsian frill. Kind of dug back in and found some bone in situ. And the the bone is pretty well preserved. Uh, there's probably a number of elements preserved here, so. Uh, and very, very easy to work matrix. You can see this stuff is just, you can brush it away with a paintbrush. It's so, so light and flaky. So very, very soft matrix, very easy to, to work. And the other thing that's really wonderful is that they're, different bones give you different amounts of information about your animal. The one bone that sort of gives you the most information about what species you're dealing with with the, with the horned dinosaurs is the parietal. And that's the bone that we found here. So we could have found this thing spent you know a year digging back in here and finally found the parietal or not found it at all but in fact the first thing we stumbled across was the most important bone the parietal so lucky with that yeah yeah, yeah. so everything's just kind of perfect and the parietal it seems to show some weird features that doesn't really fit anything we've seen before mm -hmm. the back of the parietal seems to curve forward a bit it's got a couple of epoxipitals these little hornlets there that are curling forward it's incredibly thick and massive uh, and so it's very, very likely that this will become the holotype, uh, you know, knock on wood, this could become the holotype of a, a new species or new genus of horned dinosaurs. So it's pretty exciting to work on something like this. And, you know, I've never found anything like this before in my career, so it's kind of a, kind of sort of a bucket list thing. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, you guys are really, really lucky to see this. This is not something that happens every day. Definitely not. a paleontologist. <laughs> Not just the first dinosaur dig broadcast on Twitch, but the first, you know, new new dinosaur taxon, new genus or new species. Yeah. Um, very, very lucky. I hope everybody realizes how fortunate they are watching this. This is, uh, you're not going to see this anywhere else. You're not going to see this on TV either. This is, uh, this is pretty cool. Thanks for walking us through that. Yeah, yeah sure. Um, 
Really, really neat. Maybe we should talk a little bit about, like, the... There are bits in... Well, we've got another skull of uh, a Ceratopsian dinosaur from the Almond Formation that's never been properly described. Uh, Barnum Brown dug it up in 1937, and this may or may not be the same animal, but, uh... Yeah, yeah. It, that one's never been named, so... Even if it is the same animal, which... Who knows if it is? It'll, if it is the same species, it will give us a lot more information about that species. Because that one didn't have a parietal, did it? No, it's missing. It's, it's a nearly complete skull, and it's missing uh -huh. the back. Shoot. So that's that's kind of the trick about these animals is that there's what I call the, the magic bone for a lot of species. <laughs> is that yeah. there's one element. If you have that element, you so bam, this is I know what I'm dealing with. Yep. I know what family, I know what genus, I know what species. Because that particular part evolves really quickly. It's yeah. very, very different, distinctive. So in, the, in the ceratops, it's, it's the parietal have the parietal and nothing yeah. else like Chasmosaurus belli was originally named on the basis of parietal <laughs> and it's still a valid taxon today uh, and conversely you can have the complete skull and be missing the back of it and not be entirely certain what species you have and mm -hmm. that's the issue with the other skull the one in New York is that it's, it's nearly complete but it's missing the back yeah so we found the back of the frill of this of <laughs> a ceratopsian that may or may not be the same thing that's in New York mm -hmm. uh, but if we can find some other pieces we might be able to kind of some overlap we could say okay this is or isn't the same thing as the one in New York and <laughs> What the New York one is, is is not entirely clear. It's been called Ankyceratops, but it has kind of a, a very, a kind of more tall, narrow nostril than the Ankyceratops. It could be it's more kind of a Pentaceratops-like animal. It could be something else entirely. We don't really know, uh, but hopefully these elements will help us figure out at least, you know, what the heck is going on with the horned dinosaurs in the almond formation. Yeah. How does uh, Ankyceratops stack up temporally? Is it older, younger than this? I think, I don't... I don't know off the top of my head either. I don't know off the top of my ask, head. I think yeah. you're talking about, I think it's a little bit younger, but uh -huh. not a lot. Um, and so it could be something related to that. It could sure. be the same genus. This could be ancestral to Ankyceratops, yeah, for yeah. all we know. We, we yeah. just don't, uh, yeah, we don't really know what the heck is going on here. Which is exciting. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Holy it's cow. Been, yeah. New frontier. Yeah, uh, exactly. It's, I don't know. I guess it's not all that often that you get to work on something like this in science where... You know, it's going to be new and exciting no matter what you find. Yeah, it's, it's such yeah. a privilege to be able to do this. Yeah, that's one of the fun things about working in a place like the Almond Formation. Is if you were out in, say, the Hell Creek Formation, mm -hmm. there's new new stuff out there to be sure. There's new species, new discoveries. But most of what you're going to find in the Hell Creek Formation will be Triceratops, Triceratops, Taurosaurus, Tyrannosaurus, Triceratops, 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 and Triceratops. Yeah. And Owen and Monosaurus. So it's going to be, you know, you're going to go through a huge number of sites that will produce something we've already seen before. And those specimens do produce new information. They do yeah. give us more information, the biology, the It's good to have a good evolution. sample size for all these things, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's yeah. wonderful having a huge sample size of Triceratops. Mm -hmm. But here, you know, the first diagnostic <laughs> horned dinosaur we get is almost certainly going to be a new species. Yeah. So we get to find something new that's basically never been found before. <laughs> so uh, I don't know. Who knows? It's kind of, you know, I feel like it's maybe a bit of... You know, again, knock on wood, but maybe a bit of a paleontological legacy. Like, <laughs> maybe someday this will be some kid's favorite dinosaur. Yeah, think about that. Uh, Holy cow. So we'll have to, if, if it is new, we'll have to come up with a cool name for it. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, I don't know. Maybe get some little plastic toys made. <laughs> yeah, I'd love to sculpt some and, and you know, live on stream and then 3D print them. That would be pretty yeah, neat. Yeah. Um, yeah, really, really cool. Uh, so let's maybe talk about what this is, this jacket right here, and what was the process in getting it to this point? Yeah, so again, this has gone kind of textbook, uh, is once we find the fossil, we expose it, we expose the surface and kind of delimit it and figure out how far it goes. And then we leave a margin of, of rock around it of, you know, anywhere from th say three to six inches, and then we cut down around the bone, kind of isolating it. Then we put a separator layer of, you know, you can use paper towel mm -hmm. or newspaper or toilet paper or tin foil to, to, to protect the bone. And then we put plaster and burlap over the top. And so... Yeah, so that's what this is right here, everybody, in case anybody's wondering. You can see the burlap fibers in there, and then this chunky white stuff is obviously the plaster of Paris. Yeah. Yeah, and this is this is very old school, very old technology. I think yeah. O.C. Marsh back in the late 1800s. Yeah, one I of his crews came up with that method. Yeah, yeah. It, it was which was applied from uh, you know when they started making casts to set broken bones, mm -hmm. uh, you know to hold bones together. This is a good way to hold bones together. So the rock, 
The rock is incredibly strong in compression. You can put hundreds of pounds of weight on top of it, but the moment it's under tension, it'll all fly apart. It, it, rock is very, very weak in tension. So what you need to do is have some, some tensile elements to help hold it together, and that's what the burlap does, yep. is they help tie the whole thing together. And it's actually kind of a primitive composite material, sort of like you know carbon fiber or, or fiberglass, uh, where you have tensile elements, the, the burlap, and then kind of a compressive uh, a matrix of, of the plaster. And so you lay down these strips of burlap that are impregnated with plaster and kind of coat the whole thing. So you put a top coat, uh, a kind of a cap on first, trench down a little bit, put kind of a neck of plaster and burlap around that, and then pedestal further until you have sort of like this mushroom of rock mm -hmm. uh, encased in this plaster and burlap cap, and then you flip it over. Yeah, so what uh -huh. you're looking at right here is basically upside down. This is, you know, completely inverted from the way that we found it. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah. for the best, I don't know, hour or so, uh, Nick and the guys have been carving this down, just removing the matrix from this in order to lighten it and make it much easier to move. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it would have been fun to show you guys the uh, the flipping process. <laughs> However... <laughs> I would get nervous about you. Yeah, that that, that's the most risky process, <laughs> part of the entire process. That's yeah. what can go wrong. Uh-huh. Everybody holds their breath and just... Yeah. Because if you get a, a bad flip, everything can just spill out from the bottom. Yeah. Um, you can break your specimen in half. You could crumble it into a million pieces like mm -hmm. the... The jacket can separate and the specimen falls out in a million pieces. It could, yep. uh, so it's the place where everything could go wrong, and we wouldn't want that on live, uh, live on social media, yeah, destroying shoot. our holotype. <laughs> so that that we, we kind of like waited until it was safely, mm -hmm. uh, safely out of the quarry to show you guys this part. Uh, and again, it just kind of went like it went textbook. We got a really yep. uh, very deep trench around it, very nice pedestal. Uh, we kept prepping and prepping until it was a bit loose and you could kind of rock it and then we rolled mm -hmm. it over onto its back and, and have prepped down to expose uh, or almost to the bone layer. Yeah. And so this is just kind of like, this is this is how it's done. <laughs> uh, and again, I keep saying like, you know, I, we couldn't have done this better if we staged it. <laughs> um, there's no way if you even staged this, you could have, yeah. it'd be very, very hard to find the specimen, do everything properly and have it come out like this. God, don't tell the flat earth people that. They'll say that we're faking it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's uh, <laughs> But um, yeah, uh, this is, it's kind of yeah, it's kind of sort of so far sort of a, again knock on wood kind of perfect, perfect find and perfect dig and and uh, you know just kind of and there's there's you know there's more in the ground potentially so we or or definitely there's at least a few more fragments yeah. in there so we've got kind of our work cut out for us maybe for the rest of the field season or maybe next year or so uh, more to do and it's yeah it's fun fun working on something like this I mean it, it's it's cool being a part of a find like this but also the work is sort of intrinsically enjoyable mm -hmm. you know just working with your hands and uh, uh, you know the results are very tangible you know between the, the start of the day and the end of the day you can see what you've done you can see yep. you know, matrix removed uh, specimens jacketed you know and just kind of you can see progress <laughs> whereas a lot of a lot of type of works we do these days is like you know you know typing on your laptop it feels like you can spend a week on something. You don't really see a lot of progress, but this it's very it's very tangible. The results, and yeah, it's just fun working with your hands. Uh, kind of like a kid in a sandbox, <laughs> but you get paid to do it. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Very very cool. So you can see where this is the pedestal. Uh, yesterday we had the jacket. You know, it was upside down obviously, or it's upside down right now, but it was just this big, almost egg-looking thing up there. Uh, and you saw us jacket that on Friday. Uh, we put our first layer on, and that was a ton of fun. I'm so glad everybody got to see that. We've been talking about jacketing so many times on my channel before, and uh, you know, I, I one time I tried to put together a, you know, like a, a jacketing tutorial thing in the kitchen, and it just wasn't going to translate to uh, to a broadcast very well. So it was really cool that we actually got to see the real thing, not simulated. Um, and this is this is the aftermath after we flip it. Um, if Ethan gets back in time, he's doing a supply run right now in town. If he gets back in time, then we might even uh, top jacket this thing live on stream, so you get to see that. Top jacket, bottom jacket, whatever you want to call it. This is the underside right here. So it's funny, this thing's been sitting here on the ground for 73 million years. Yeah, yeah. And uh, just flipped it over this morning. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, this 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 bone hasn't seen daylight in 73 million years. Now here it is being streamed on social media. <laughs> Pretty awesome. Yeah. yeah. Let's see. I think we've got some questions. And there is there is footage of us flipping it, but not. Uh, I think Ethan's dad and Ethan's girlfriend were were filming at the time, but it went pretty well. 
we made extra sure to uh, to try and undercut it and, and put some strips along the bottom. So you'll see right here. See what kind of curves around like that. Again, we want to make it as much like a mushroom as we can so that all of this would hold in the rock so it doesn't just spill out of the bottom when we go to flip it. But you can only do so much of that. There's always some inherent risk in a flip. Um, so again, that's like the most high tension moment on usually any dinosaur excavation is, uh, yeah, yeah, is when you got to flip the individual jackets. And shoot, we've seen footage of a flip gone horribly, horribly wrong. Uh, many people in the chat were here when we were watching, we've watched it multiple times, the, uh, the Borealopelta holotype. Have you seen this, Nick? No. Yeah, um, when they were collecting that, it was like Sunoco Mining Company or mm -hmm. something like that stumbled across this yeah. uh, notosaur in marine sediments. Yeah, yeah. And uh, they made this enormous jacket, and then they tried to, uh, I guess they weren't flipping it, they were trying to pick it up with a crane. Yeah. And the whole thing just comes completely apart. Oh, just a million pieces. Yeah. And it was like a media event. Like, they were... You know, they were filming this, there was a lot of hype around it, and yeah. just complete disaster. This is, I mean, that's the thing, is it might seem like this is really crude and low-tech, but there's, it's it's difficult stuff. It's yeah. like complex problem-solving, real-world problem-solving, and yeah, we're using crude materials, plaster and burlap, but there's a lot of technique that goes into this. And, you know, and that's one thing is, like, I find, like, you know, I spend a lot of my time as an academic, I'm reading papers, I'm giving lectures, being very academic, but there's this hands-on stuff, and it might not <laughs> exercise your brain in the same way as using, doing computer models or whatever the heck, but it's difficult. And it's like, this is not easy. And it requires <laughs> a certain, like, you know, skill with your hands. Like, it's mm -hmm. like being a skilled craftsman, like a carpenter or something, to be able to make a good jacket. And we, we, the team pr produced an amazing jacket here. Uh, but, yeah, there's so many places this could go wrong, and it didn't. But we had to, like, every step of the way, you're always trying to think, <laughs> how could this be screwed up? Yeah. And then, like, how do we prevent that from... Uh, you know, I, I tell students sometimes when you know if they're working on fossils in the lab that like you know, you know, time time is trying to destroy your fossil. The world is very hostile, and like <laughs> very few of these things have survived. They've been destroyed by any of the things or erosion or eaten by other dinosaurs, fossils. It's very, you know, the world is kind of hostile to your dinosaur. You have to be very protective of it. Mm -hmm. And every time you see something that could threaten <laughs> your your dinosaur, you have to like always think of what could possibly go wrong and uh, be a bit paranoid, really. And so we've been every step of the way. We've been trying to think of how could this go wrong? Yeah. How could we screw it up? How could and just make sure every step of the way that we we do this right, use you know, go a little bit overboard in terms of going well around the specimen. Yeah. Uh, nice and cautious. Deeper than we need to. Uh, more plaster than we need to. Every just a, just a safety factor uh, to make sure that everything comes out perfectly here. And, and if it was just like some isolated hadrosaur limb bone, we wouldn't go to quite that extreme. But with uh -huh. this. Uh, it's important. Yeah, Extremely you kind of got to think important. about what, what could go wrong and then it, and head it off. And, and Yeah, just try and uh, be as clever as you can about certain things. Yeah, yeah. Like, And it comes down to, like, what's the ratio of plaster to water when you're mixing yeah. mixing that? You know, if you're doing, a, you know, an undercoat like this, you know, uh, along the underside of the jacket, undercut like that, you want to make the, you know, the plaster extra, extra thick so it sets up yeah. faster and so that it clings better and... There's just a million little things like that that all work together. They all contribute yeah. to uh, uh, to success in a situation yeah. like this. And it, it takes a, it takes a lot of education to do it right, but that yeah. might not be education you could get in a PhD program. <laughs> no. So you could, yeah. you could get a PhD and have no idea how to do this, but we've got. A I lot know of people, people like that. Yeah. Yeah, we've got people <laughs> out here like in, you know are doing construction or whatever the heck, or truck drivers or whatever. And uh -huh. sometimes that that real world experience can translate better to field work sure. than necessarily the type of stuff that I do, where I'm lecturing in a lecture theater. Uh, again, it's all very academic. You get up in front of an audience and kind of bullshit your way through anything. <laughs> Can I say that on your Twitch? Uh, <laughs> okay. Let's try and keep it PG, but okay, thank you. I will. <laughs> We're not in Utah anymore, though. We're in exactly. Wyoming. We kind of play a little more fast and loose here in Wyoming. But yeah, a bit more, more rough and tumble. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. Wow. Well, let's maybe talk a little bit about the lithology, too, if we've got a minute. Um... We've been really, really lucky in that a lot of this is really, really friable stuff. Like, you can basically just pull it apart with your hands uh, up high here. And so the fragments that we found at the beginning were kind of in that. But the deeper you go, the harder the rock got. We've got oof, over here. It's going to be kind of blocky mudstone. This is directly underneath the jacket. And uh, we found a lot of organics in here. 
Like, there's a lot of roots. Let me see if we've got any roots left over from yesterday if we collected them all. Um, but yeah, there's a horizon with just all these roots going out horizontally. Which, yeah, there's some organic bits in there. So these dark parts right here are probably the remains. Uh, that's probably a root right there. Yeah, and there's some in here too. Look at those beautiful. Thank you, Nick. Yeah, excellent roots in here. Uh, so that tells me it's most likely not a fluvial environment, probably not like a river system that laid this down. This is probably like a lake. This is something with more still water where you can just get organic material like that that settles down to the bottom and stays put. It's not like it's got a lot of current going through. So maybe during like a seasonal flood or something like that, this was a little oxbow lake. Maybe these bones got washed into there or maybe the dinosaur died here or... I don't know. It does seem to be disarticulated, so... There is a decent chance it got washed in during a, a small flooding event or something into like a little oxbow lake in the side of a river. Could be some scavenging too. Could be a tyrannosaur or some dromaeosaur. Yeah. Kind of biting, biting uh, tearing it apart. It'd be wonderful to look for some bite marks uh, on this specimen. That would be pretty cool to see if they, uh, if they turn up. Because you do get those on Ceratopsians a lot in Hell Creek especially. Um, do you get a lot of bite marks in like the dinosaur park formation and stuff too? I think it's reasonably common. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, the tyrannosaurs bite into bone. And, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think a lot of these things saw a lot of scavenging. A couple of years ago, I was lucky enough to go out to the Serengeti and uh, kind of watch, you know, hyenas pulling a carcass apart. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they, <laughs> they don't leave a lot of stuff laying around for very long. And you see these, like, the remains of this where there's, like, just a, a wildebeest skull and a few vertebrae, mm -hmm. which is all that's left after, after the predators and, and scavengers get get done with it and yeah. it kind of makes you think oh <laughs> makes sense that's why my yeah. dinosaur is missing all these pieces <laughs> and so it's like uh you know it's just like there's there's a lot of there's you know when you when you feed on things people things come along and yep. gnaw on a bone maybe eat a bone drag it off to feed on it somewhere else and and uh so it, and just kind of disarticulate so, so it could be something like that is going on it could also be the waters jumbled it up um it looked to me like some of the bone had like a uh, it's kind of the mudstone underneath and on top of the bone was more like a sandstone or something uh -huh. like that maybe a little stream came in and covered it up could well be yeah so, yeah uh, yeah it's but yeah we're, we're seeing like in addition to the bones themselves we have the remains of this ancient ecosystem that existed here 73 million years ago in this kind of coastal lowland with you know rivers and swamps on the edge of the western interior seaway so we have you know kind of a fossil ecosystem you know around the bone <laughs> it's uh yeah it's kind of interesting to wonder about how these things lived yeah, really interesting stuff. Now, speaking about the uh, the carcasses getting kind of torn apart, did you yeah. see the uh, the sheep car carcass that's down there by the road? Uh, I don't it's, know. I think I missed that. It's scattered over like maybe a three or four meter area. Um, but yeah, there's a skull and jaws and like bits of wool and stuff. And then you've got like the vertebrae further up the hill and and, and that's just coyotes. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. that's not a tyrannosaur. Yeah, it's like biting move through these very things. large bones. Oh yeah, yeah. And uh, so it's kind of in some ways it's almost remarkable we ever get any skeletons at all. Uh, yeah, bite marks are fairly common on, on bones, you know, from tyrannosaurs and other smaller things, uh, dromaeosaurs and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. you, also, you also see uh, tooth wear on tyrannosaur teeth, where the apex of the tooth or kind of the carina is, is heavily ground down and worn, yeah. and that's because they're biting into bones. Mm -hmm. So some of that's probably, you know, happens when they're engaged in predation and attacking animals. But sometimes also as they tear these carcasses apart, they're kind of blunting their teeth. <laughs> so tyrannosaurs seem to have been kind of, you know, much less delicate in their feeding than a lot of other dinosaurs. They show much <laughs> higher tooth wear. Yeah. So they're probably much more, you know, much more effective as scavengers than a lot of the other animals were. Yeah, really interesting stuff. Especially when you think about tyrannosaurs feeding on like a ceratopsian carcass. There's so many bony protrusions. There's the frill, there's the beak, there's the horns. And if you're going to be like moving this carcass around, you've got to bite into those things in order to do that. Yeah, we actually see that in like uh, Triceratops skull elements in the Hell Creek, where there's like kind of a consistent pattern, it seems, in that you get like uh, kind of little nibbly bite marks around certain areas that are probably the premaxillary teeth, um, just kind of like nibbling bits of flesh off of stuff like the, the occipital condyle, which is like the, you know, where the skull attaches to the neck. It's kind of like a ball and socket joint or almost like a trailer hitch trailer ball you find like little nip marks from these uh little premaxillary teeth on there um and then in bigger bones like the sacrum uh or the you know the, the pelvis you find like big round puncture marks that are probably 
from like the maxillary or the dentary teeth, uh, just like punching through this bone. It's neat stuff. Yeah, you know, one reason we might get a lot of skulls and frills for these dinosaurs is that uh, compared to the rest of the skeleton, the, the bones, the frill are quite heavy and there would have been very little meat on them. Yeah. So there's probably like, there's some blood vessels and skin and then like this kind of heavily keratinized, you know, kind of almost horny skin that would have covered the frill. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's basically a big armor shield with very little meat on it. So it's probably the type of thing a tyrannosaur would not want to spend a lot of time trying to eat. Right. So they might like eat the rest of the skeleton, consume some of the bones, drag other ones away to kind of gnaw on them and just leave the frill bones. That yep. might be why we have such a good record of things like triceratops or skulls. <laughs> uh, and there's, it just seems like there's a lot less Triceratops post crania on the fossil record. Is that right? Because you've been in the Fallow oh, Creek a lot. I mean, it, part of it's collection bias, okay. and that if you find trike post crania, you usually just don't collect it. Yeah, okay. But um, it does seem like it, it could be like predation and scavenging, where just the rest of the body gets eaten and the, there's not much meat on the skull. We do actually have evidence that Tyrannosaurs were probably ripping the heads off of Triceratops in the process of feeding, because we'll find bite marks on the underside of the frill. And like I was saying, on the occipital condyle, and you can't get to that stuff if the head is attached. So, uh, yeah, yeah, pretty wild stuff. And there would have been tyrannosaurs in this environment doing the same thing. Um, we haven't found any tyrannosaur material here yet. Cross your fingers. But, uh, you know, this is a late Cretaceous North American environment. You've got ceratopsians, you've got hadrosaurs, you know, your duckbills. You're going to have tyrannosaurs, too. Yeah, I think your, your predator-prey ratio is probably around 10 to 1 or something. Yeah. And so, you know, we, you know, I think we've so far found 20 sites. We haven't found a tyrannosaur next, but, like, yet, but, like, you know, we could the very next site. You know, I think if we find another 10 or 20 or 30 sites, it's, mm -hmm. yeah, there's a very good chance we will get a tyrannosaur here. Although, you know, as that being said, it might just be a foot or something and not something complete and yeah. diagnostic with a skull, but... If we, if we get enough dinosaur skeletons, eventually one of them will be a Tyrannosaur sooner yeah. or later. It's just pretty much a numbers game, you know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Golganek wants to know, any beak bites that might indicate Ceratopsian conflict? I haven't I haven't really seen anything. Like, I know we've got potential evidence of Stegosaur tail spikes inflicting grievous wounds on meat-eating dinosaurs like Allosaurus. I don't think I... Off the top of my head, I can't think of any Ceratopsian bite marks that not, have ever been proposed. Bite, but, like, uh, yeah. they've got those giant horns. That's probably what they're fighting with. And you yeah. can see puncture marks and gouges on the frill. Uh -huh. And, I mean, these things... You know, I, I got a look at a Taurosaurus skull recently, and it's just... It's just amazing. Like, the... The horns on these things are enormous. They have these just massive bait horn bases, which would give them incredible strength and bending. And they have mm -hmm. these long horns coming out. They're basically these giant, and the, uh, the keratinous sheath would make them even longer. So these horns might have been like, you know, a meter and a half or two meters long. Mm -hmm. uh, very strong. There's these giant spears. And then the, the bones of the face are actually really thick. They're an inch thicker more. Yeah. So it's like basically a bony helmet. Really, really fused, yeah, too. It, it, yeah, it, they're thickened, they're fused, they're rugose. There's quite a lot of very, uh, very tough keratinous tissue over there. So basically armor. And then the shield uh, is fairly thick up front, and depending on the species, can be thicker, thin in the back. But basically, you've got this uh, two giant spears, this armored helmet face, and then a shield there. And basically, and then on top of that, the... You know, across the back of the skull of these things is incredibly wide, and that's all muscle back there. Mm -hmm. so yeah. The neck on these things, I think I did a quick back of the envelope calculation. <laughs> you might have had around, you know, 500 kilograms, 1,000 pounds of muscle back there. Holy cow. So, you know, imagine like a squat, you know, like five football players holding <laughs> this giant. Oh, wait, we're back on. All right. Nice. Everybody, you know, that's Starlink. That's just how <laughs> this works. Uh, but welcome back, everybody. Yeah, excellent. Um, 327 people now. Uh, I'm gonna go cover up the router and the solar generator with one of those covers. Because we've got our first couple of raindrops here. Hopefully this is just something super isolated. But, uh, yeah, yeah. And Buffalo Safari, no, let's not hope for thunder. Because if we hope, if we get thunder, then I'm gonna have to wrap this up. We'll have to go back to the vehicles and shelter. Like, lightning's no joke. That's not something we mess around with here. Um... So yeah, yeah. Do not hope for thunder. <laughs> uh, but let's see. Here's our setup. Here, I'm gonna take one of these and just preemptively, I'm gonna stick that over our router and over our ah shoot solar generator. Put that like this. 
because those are not supposed to get wet. And here comes the wind. So I can put this like this to hold it on, and that should be good. All right. But yeah. Uh, hey, Ios and Lordy are here too. Welcome, welcome. How are you doing? Great to see you. Yeah. Excellent. So yeah, if anybody's just waltzed in recently, let me do a quick little intro again. I feel like a radio station where you've got to do like the, uh, what do they call that? Anyway, you've got to say the station name and blah, 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 and all that stuff. Welcome back to Paleontologizing. Uh, my name is Danny Anduza. I'm a dinosaur paleontologist, and I stream paleontology, fossil science, here on Twitch. And holy cow, did you tune in at a wonderful time. We are out in the field in western Wyoming, kind of near the town of Green River, and uh, we're digging up dinosaurs. We've got what will most likely be a new species, maybe a new genus of Ceratopsian dinosaur, horned dinosaur, and that is right up there. There's Dr. Nick Longridge. He's published on Ceratopsians before, and uh, he found this on his first day out prospecting. So, uh, yeah, pretty excellent. We've been extraordinarily lucky with this. Um, we got the best possible bone you could get if you want to uh, identify a new species of Ceratopsian. So, uh, pretty exciting stuff. We got the parietal. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. Uh, good stuff. Oh, yeah, station identification. Thank you, MS Coggins. That's the term. Yeah. Uh, Kimplex says, K-Dig on Twitch.tv, coming to you live from the middle of nowhere. <laughs> it really kind of is the middle of nowhere, but we're using the Starlink here. Got a solar generator. And uh, getting a few raindrops here, but hopefully it's nothing serious or I'll have to end the broadcast. So cross your fingers. Yeah. Yeah. Um... Buffalo Safari says Wyoming must be the least known state. It's definitely the least populous state. There are fewer people who live in Wyoming than live in Rhode Island or Alaska or Hawaii or Hawaii actually has a pretty high population. There's like maybe a couple million people. Uh, Wyoming has something like 750,000 people or something. Somebody can look up the population of Wyoming uh, at present, but it's not very high. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, yeah. And Anastasia says there's nothing in Wyoming except wind. Well, wind and dinosaurs. <laughs> Wyoming is well known for its dinosaurs. And, uh, yeah, we've, uh, we've got a new one right here. Pretty exciting. Yeah. Uh. Nick is just cleaning the surface off right there, kind of cleaning out some of the matrix to help lighten it, and then hopefully before too long we'll put a lid on this thing, and uh, once that dries, we can maybe take it down to the truck and bring it back to camp. Um, yeah, you do have to worry a little bit about fossil poachers in an area like this, so it's good to get this thing out ASAP, so we're trying to do that today. Um, but yeah, yeah. And shoot, Wyoming's only got 578,000 people. That's, that's nuts. <laughs> Holy cow. There are more, way more people who live in the city of San Francisco than in the entire state of Wyoming. That's crazy. And seven by seven miles, you know, almost twice as many people as live here. You know, Wyoming is not one of the smallest states. It's, it's big. Anybody who's ever driven across it can tell you that. That, uh... Yeah. Although, Nick, you were saying Alaska is humongous. The population density is yeah, far, far yeah. lower yeah. in Alaska. Nick is from Alaska originally. Um, so you were like, oh, yeah, this is, this is crowded out here in Wyoming. Too many people. Ah, you're claustrophobic. <laughs> more space. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, actually, uh, I feel just at home here. I love it. <laughs> I love these wide open spaces and just endless horizons. will be there. It is pretty great. I mean, take a look. At that vista. Yeah, and this is, you know, kind of a, a small little valley right here. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's funny, 
since this is a live broadcast, we get all kinds of people trickling in, like asking questions about stuff that we already talked about, and that's how live streams are, you know? But uh, just to recap, we've got uh, part of the frill of a ceratopsian dinosaur, a horned dinosaur. Everybody is familiar with Triceratops as a horned dinosaur. This is from the same family. It's better than Triceratops. <laughs> certainly, uh, certainly newer. I, I might um, be biased, but... Newer in terms of its discovery, not newer in terms yeah, of age. It's a few million years older, I guess. Yeah, yeah. So this is from 73 million years ago. Triceratops... When does Triceratops originate? Probably about 68, maybe 69 million years ago, something like that. I think, well, we don't really know the, the age to base the Hell Creek, but yeah. you know, it's, it's there from about 66 million years down to maybe 67 or so. Mm. Uh, so at least that far, maybe a bit bit further yeah. back in time before that. And all, it gets kind of wishy-washy. It's like, at what point do you, you know, do you call it Triceratops? Some yeah. people think Eo Triceratops might just be a very old Triceratops, or it might be something different. It's or... a bit arbitrary. Uh, yeah. But yeah, I mean, we're probably about six million years before the, the oldest Triceratops in the Hell Creek. Yeah. Which is a non-trivial amount of time. I mean, we split off from chimpanzees around six or seven million years ago, so that's that's how much evolution separates this animal from Triceratops, you know, yeah. the dinosaurs. Uh, and, and in that time, there's a lot of evolution happening, a lot of species appearing and then going extinct. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. The only constant is change. Yeah. Um. <laughs> you know, that's the interesting thing is we used to think these dinosaur species lasted a long time, and now it looks like they maybe only last like a million or half a million years. Mm -hmm. they, in general, there might be a couple species that last a bit longer, but almost every single dinosaur where we have good information, they, they have very brief lives. They, mm -hmm. they evolve quite rapidly into new species, the environment changes, and they either evolve into something else or they go extinct. And so basically if you move up or down about a million years in time you have a totally new crop of species hmm. uh not something radically different necessarily maybe a slightly different species of pentaceratops or triceratops but yeah just time travel you just like go forward or backwards new species so it turns out to be surprisingly easy i mean well not that easy to find new dinosaurs <laughs> but you, you move you move up or down in time and you find new things and that's yep. what we're doing here is by looking at this time interval uh, which is particularly poorly known. It's a bit younger than Dinosaur Park Formation. I think it's a bit older than the Horseshoe Canyon Formation or most of the well-known stuff there. So we're in a time interval that's just not well sampled. So most of what we find here is going to be new. Yeah, really, really exciting stuff. I know I keep saying that, but it's yeah. it's you really can't say it enough yeah. in a situation like this. Yeah, yeah, it's, um, it's a great find. It's it's really we're really lucky and really privileged to be able to work on this thing and be part of its discovery. For sure. Yeah. Um, let's see. Ethan is not back yet, so I wonder what did he say about? Can we top jacket this thing without him? Or uh... I'm not quite sure what we want to do. Like I think if you can get a saw and we can cut these other yeah. pieces off, we can make a much lighter, stronger jacket. I did call him up, and he said he's going to try and pick up a saw there, okay. something serrated. So I would suggest we. That's my my suggestion is we kind of cut cut the jacket down. Yeah. Put on a bit of top jacket. Cut the other half and top jacket. Mm -hmm. and have something much lighter and stronger. If we try and do it ourselves, I mean, we could do it, but, like, I think uh, with that, we'd have something better. Yeah, than... I've got a knife with some serrations, so in a pinch, if he forgets to bring a saw, yeah. we could make that work, but it's... It... It'd be a lot easier with a proper <laughs> it would be saw. a lot easier with a saw, yeah. Uh, yeah, so yeah. I, that's my... I don't know. I mean, there's different ways to do it, but that that's probably the optimal way to do it. No, you're great. Yeah. yeah. We'll cut it down so there's yeah. maybe about three inches of yeah. lip around it, and then, uh, yeah... yeah. We'll kind of pack that with paper towels and um, just around the edges yeah. uh, to give it a little bit of air, and then we put the top jacket over that, yeah. and it'll make a nice lip that'll be you know, kind of like a, a lip that you can cut around and just remove the top like a lid when it gets back to the lab. But we yeah. just got to make sure that... Uh, Slow and steady. Yeah, yeah. And make sure that everything adheres really well to the surface there, because if it's concave, if it's not sticking... Yeah, oftentimes with a, when we put a top jacket on, the way that I was trained is that you don't put paper towel over everything if it's just matrix under there. You actually you can actually put plaster directly onto the matrix, and that way it sticks okay, better. Yeah, it, it won't pull up, and it actually gives the jacket some extra strength. Okay, that, that sounds good. Yeah, I, I think we could probably just this may or may not be bone or just maybe a rind there, but maybe cover this up and then just like yeah, like you say, straight plaster on the rest of this it should be pretty strong. Mm -hmm. And especially, I mean, it's like as we remove the matrix, it's just like the jacket has less work to do. Yeah. So initially we had, I mean, I don't know, maybe a, a hundred, couple hundred pounds of matrix here, and then mm -hmm. we had carved that all down. So yeah. the all plaster has a lot less to carry. It's a lot less likely to break when we, we've kind of trimmed it down like this. Yeah. But yeah, 
<laughs> Holy Lifton wants to know, what point <laughs> does Nick tell you to take your hands out of your pockets and pick up a brush? Nick's doing a great job right now, and this is really... It's fun. Yeah. We're, we're Get just... away from my fossil. I want to... It's, it's, no, it's fun work. It's like, uh, you know, it's, again, it's like, it's kind of like working with your hands. It's like, uh, I don't know. I, I mean, I, as an evolution biologist, the thing about this, like, I think... It, we're tool using primates. We spent millions of years banging rocks together. <laughs> I think there's a part of us deep in our brain that just loves to work with our hands and work with rock. And so I think I think working with your hands is kind of like it's good for the soul at some level. So I like working with my hands. I mean, I love <laughs> I love the like the, the, the airy fairy world of, of theory and you know, my what I call my thinky thoughts. Uh, <laughs> theory is all well and good, but I think you know getting your hands dirty is. Uh, it also keeps you humble because when you're working with your hands, things go wrong or things break. It makes you realize you, you're not always as clever as you think you are. <laughs> so I think working with your hands is great, and I love doing it. Uh, I could be back in the lab right now writing papers, and part of me wants to be, but I, I do enjoy this. Yeah. I mean, shoot, you don't have anything like this in the UK. This is... Uh, oh, no. Yeah, yeah. This is the, pretty extraordinary to be in a... The are an American original. <laughs> Well, maybe Mexican too, but like yeah. uh, they have some, some down there. But no, this is a this is an American group of dinosaurs. Uh, there's one species that gets over in China, the Sinoceratops. But other than that, these guys are these guys are, are born and bred in Western North America, yeah. and this is their origin, and this is where they reach their highest diversity. And you you can't find them anywhere else. And certainly this subgroup, we, if, if it's a chasmosaur, this is the only place in the world you can find them. <laughs> Pretty awesome too, and the Ceratopsians. They're a fairly young group of dinosaurs. They really only show up in the late Cretaceous, and yeah, like they're fairly short-lived, but they become extremely diverse. Yeah, they, they really evolve rapidly, and a lot of the dinosaurs do that. The Ceratopsians, the Ductiles, the Tyrannosaurus, mm -hmm. they basically go from just like, you know, from in about 25 million years from the Tyronean up to, up to the Mastricti, and they just go, undergo an incredible diversification. We're getting rained on here. Yeah, so we might want to put the tarp over that, yeah. and I might have to wrap up the stream as a result. Okay. Or at least, Put the camera under a tarp until this passes. Yeah, I don't need to tarp that. Yeah. Maybe. Should be good. Yeah. Put a couple of rocks over it very gingerly or around the sides. Yeah. We do get these bursts of wind that come through, and it's good to weigh down the tarp a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, and this rain's coming from this direction, so if I stand like this and keep the mobile encoder behind me like that, as long as the rain doesn't get too much worse, I think we'll be okay, as long as it doesn't get into the camera, too. But yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. Well, we've got a good question. Holy Lifton wants to know, what drove the fast evolution of dinosaurs? I, it depends on who you ask. I mean, endemism is maybe the leading idea. I, I, it's boy, it's complicated. I, I think one thing is like, you know, sort of nature abhors a vacuum, and when we have a bunch of unoccupied niches, things evolve to fill it. And it seems like you know, around about the middle of the Cretaceous, there's a lot of extinction. And so the Tyronean, you have very, very low diversity. There's like you know, there's that little tiny Tyrannosaur they found in New Mexico. There's Zuniceratops. There's a Therizinosaur. Not a lot else. It's pretty low diversity and. So I mean, it got extremely warm there, and there's some volcanic eruptions, and so maybe that's kind of knocked the diversity down. Hmm. And then the handful of things that kind of get into North America, mostly from Asia at that time, just have all these open niches, and they rapidly evolve to occupy them. So there's kind of, I, I think that my hunch is the mid-Cretaceous is a period of very high turnover, very high extinction rates. Hmm. And as we move into, into the latest Cretaceous, we're seeing radiations to fill that. Uh, not just for dinosaurs, but also for mosasaurs. So there's some interesting things. I I, I kind of like to, I, I I don't know. I can't decide what I want to do. So I keep working on different things like dinosaurs and mosasaurs. But what's interesting is when you work on different groups, you can see sometimes they kind of dance to the same tune. Mm -hmm. So the ceratopsid radiations are happening at the exact same time the mosasaur radiations are happening in the oceans, huh. uh, and certain pterosaur radiations. And my sense is there's just kind of this big crisis in the middle of Cretaceous. And then a whole bunch of different groups, dinosaurs, mosasaurs, pterosaurs, mm -hmm. are all moving in to fill these niches that are left vacant by extinction. Yeah. I mean, because it's during that time, during the middle of Cretaceous, that we lose groups like Spinosaurids. We lose yeah. Ichthyosaurs in yep. the ocean. We lose... Um, who else? Stegosaurs are completely gone by that point. The, the big pliosaurs go out, and maybe in the Cenomanian, and yeah. then the uh, uh, smaller pliosaurs surviving in the Tronian, then they go out. So you're just losing a lot of diversity. Mm -hmm. And then you have all this food nobody's, and nobody's eating, and habitat, things aren't exploiting. So 
new herbivores evolve to exploit the plants, new carnivores evolve to exploit play, exploit prey, and just like, yeah, so I, my thinking is, I think, you know, some people think of the latest Cretaceous campaign restricting as having this period of decline. I see it as a period of recovery mm. uh, where, where dinosaurs are really having a hard time as the middle Cretaceous. Like that's when we lose sauropods in North America. Mm. And at the very end, the sauropods are moving back in, maybe from South America. Like Alamosaurus, and, yeah. And, and big things like giant duckbills are evolving to replace them. So yeah. I, I see this as a period of recovery. And the dinosaurs are really just kind of getting their stride, and then bam, they're hit by that asteroid. Yeah. Uh, so that I don't know. Who knows? I mean, that's why we're out here to try and figure out some of these patterns and see what the heck's going on. So with the uh, when you talk about what was it, Zuniceratops and Nothronychus and those yeah. critters, like that not being a particularly diverse fauna, do you think that could just be sampling bias or collection bias? Like we just haven't there hasn't been enough work in that area. It, it yet? could be the Tronian. There's not a heck of a lot of good, lot of good Tronian outcrops. Definitely not. Yeah. So it, it is entirely possible. And again, uh -huh. that's why we just need to get out here and find more stuff. Yeah. Uh, you know. Yeah. I mean, that's that's the whole nature of science is that every hypothesis is potentially disprovable. Mm -hmm. um, you know, somebody that's could help find, why it's scientific. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Scientific. That's what makes it scientific is it can be proven wrong. So mm -hmm. this is, you know, that's my theory. If you don't like it, I, you know, I have others. It's like uh, you know. Evidence may emerge to show that that's incorrect, but th so far that's the way the direction that things are trending is that hmm. fairly low diversity in the Tronian. Um, I mean, in the, in the past 10 or 20 years, as people have started sampling a bit more in the Tronian, describing more things that we have not disproven that idea, and it could be it could always be disproven tomorrow, but who knows? Hmm. Oh, any idea what would it be like sea level regression or something like that that might have caused that extinction in the? The Middle Cretaceous? I know Archibald always was big on that idea. I, I don't buy that sea level is a massive driver uh, directly of extinctions. Uh -huh. I mean, uh, especially, especially with regression, if you exp if a regression would expose more land area, you're just going to get more more habitat and more species. Uh, transgression probably would, would hurt, but you're still going to have areas like uplands where a lot of diversity could be maintained. So. I just I don't see a lot of strong evidence that sea level change is a directly a driver of extinction of dinosaurs, hmm. and I suspect what we're seeing is environmental crises, uh -huh. and in particular volcanic eruptions seem to be the main thing in the Mesozoic. Those seem to be the main driver of, of big turnover events and just sort of creating these environmental crises. So it's it's really warm in the middle of the Cretaceous. Those yeah. Cretaceous the don't maximum. Yeah. The, the volcanoes are going like crazy. They're they're pumping out all the CO two. And then on top of that, you get a really big eruption and it pumps even more CO2 into the atmosphere. And, you know, you have these like uh, uh, oceanic anoxic event too, or the Bonarelli event is thought to be driven by one of these major eruptions. And mm -hmm. just like, it's already really hot. You pump more CO2 in the atmosphere, it gets super hot. And maybe certain things just can't cope with that. Although precisely how that's driving, you know, environmental crises isn't entirely clear. But it seems that things are kind of going a bit sideways in the middle of Cretaceous. Stuff's changing. Yeah, you've got angiosperms that are radiating like wild flowering plants, and that might have might potentially play some sort of role too. I don't. I don't pretend to no, know. No, it's an it's an ill wind that blows no good. I mean, <laughs> something it is something that is disastrous for one group is going to be beneficial for another. Like, you know, if your dinosaur asteroids suck, if you're a small mammal, they might actually be they allow you to radiate. And so in the same way as you're wiping out lots of groups, uh, dinosaurs, plesiosaurs, but also plants, uh, the survivors that can capitalize on that are going to be doing very well. So it's quite likely that these terrestrial ecosystems are being very stressed. I mean, if we're losing large herbivores, that implies something pretty severe is happening to the plants. Right. And maybe the group that can really capitalize on that are these angiosperms that can grow very rapidly. Mm -hmm. So my suspicion is that, you know, I don't think angiosperm radiation is directly driving the dinosaur evolution necessarily so much as just they're all responding to the same thing. You know, hmm. the angiosperms, the dinosaurs, the marine reptiles are responding to these big environmental crises. The survivors capitalize on it, and then we just get these kind of big radiations going through the end of the Cretaceous. Hmm. I mean, it's, it's a really exciting period. We're seeing the appearance of uh, angiosperm groups, uh, things like, you know, Ro roses, the rose family is appearing in the fossil record this time. Uh, species like hops, um, other things are kind of popping up in the late Cretaceous, and then the first, you know, modern mammals, our ancestors, not modern orders, but you know, yeah. modern placentals would appear. Yeah, yeah the, the crown placentals are appearing in the late Cretaceous, crown birds, um, and so a lot of things. It's becoming a much more modern fauna. Uh, lizards stage these major radiations. Mm -hmm. The iguanas appearing, modern lizards. Everybody's kind of taken off in the latest Cretaceous. It's really a period of innovation. And then you drop this big asteroid, and then the survivors kind of produce <laughs> the modern world. 
Uh, I had a question about uh, like an astronomical hypothesis for a yeah. mass extinction like that, like you know, supernovae or something like that. And I, I don't know. That sort of thing is really difficult to test. I would imagine. Like, what kind of physical evidence would a distant supernova think, leave, leave in the you fossil know, record? Supernovas, they because they they forge heavy elements, mm -hmm. and there are certain heavy elements that are forged in supernovas that you just don't get from other sources. I think there's hmm. a, if I correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's a. Uh, isotope of radioactive iron that doesn't last that long huh. and so you'll get these these and they found these in the geological record you can get uh -huh. these spikes of, of radioactive iron uh that imply like the debris from a supernova falling to earth mm -hmm. so in theory it's testable but what we have not found so far is a bunch of things all going extinct at the time we have this evidence of supernovas right so at least so far we don't have direct evidence that they are a major driver of mass extinctions it's not completely, you know, it's not unthinkable. Uh, it's actually a really interesting idea. It's just so far we don't have any direct evidence of it. Right. At least to my knowledge. And again, you know, <laughs> it, it, science being science, uh, the whole point, the whole the whole reason we do science is we don't know and we don't know everything yet. And we discoveries can prove our theories wrong. You know, hey, maybe tomorrow or in 10 years or 100 years, we will find evidence <laughs> of mass extinctions driven by, by supernovas. Yeah. Exciting stuff. I <laughs> can't. I know it's going to become a cliche at this point, but yeah, yeah. Um, and shoot, a few minutes ago, we actually got a, a raid from Hoot House live stream. There's this cool channel where they've got some cameras inside an owl nesting box. Oh, wow. And so you can like watch the owls grow up and everything, cool. and it's really neat. Wow. So they just raided in with 44 people yeah. a little while ago. Hello, all of the uh, owl admirers. It's great to have you here. Admirers of modern dinosaurs. Yeah. Shoot, what kinds of birds have we seen around here so far? What do you think your your coolest bird is that you've seen? I mean, definitely I saw a pair of falcons the other other morning. That was yeah. really got up. I couldn't sleep. It got up around six o'clock and went for a hike and saw a couple of falcons. And they were calling and yeah, I heard them. Yeah, we couldn't decide what they were if they were peregrines or or prairie falcons or whatever. But a couple of yeah. falcons out here that was pretty neat. Yeah, yeah, I've seen a lot of meadow larks and rock wrens and stuff. I think I saw a turkey vulture yesterday. It was pretty far away. I didn't have my binoculars on me. It's it's not a great place for birding, though. It's like there's, yeah. there's not a lot out here. It's a very it's a it's <laughs> pretty a harsh austere country. Yeah. 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 I mean, again, let me do a wide shot, and show everybody. Yeah. You can hear a bird calling right now, but I don't yeah. actually see a bird anywhere. It sounds like a meadowlark. Okay. Yeah. Which might even be the state bird of Wyoming. There's like seven or eight different states that have the western meadowlark as yeah. their state bird. I think Wyoming might be one of them. I know Montana is. They're actually really calling a lot right now. I don't know if it's just because we're listening to them suddenly or it's like the rain or something. is. Yeah, it could be something to do with the rain. Yeah. Luckily, the rain has subsided for the moment. Yeah. Well, we get these patchy clouds coming overhead. Some of them drop a few drops and some of them just kind of scoot overhead and don't bother us. It's very localized. Like we got yeah. dumped on in camp and we came out here and it was totally dry. Yeah, yeah. It's a good idea to have weather radar in a place like this just because the forecast is not going to be entirely reliable because again everything's so localized yeah and Gore-Tex you don't really think of that as like kind of field gear for the desert but like a good rain jacket out here is really essential. absolutely yeah yeah I'm kicking myself for not having brought a, a decent rain jacket it's back home in my closet but I've never really needed that in the field before we've had so much rain here so far but uh yeah yeah um <laughs> Might be time to uncover this. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Put the phone in my pocket. Yeah. Anybody just coming in? Show off our dinosaur here. Prepare to be underwhelmed. Look, the mudstone. <laughs> uh, yeah. So again, okay. for anybody just tuning in, this is the protective plaster jacket. Almost like a cocoon that we put around the fossil in order to keep it safe when we bring it back to the laboratory. This thing has been in the ground for 73 million years, and it's not going to be particularly happy that uh, that we're pulling it out of the ground. Yeah, we, it's been around for 73 million years, and we want to keep it keep it around for just a, a little longer until we can get back to the prep labs. So we're trying to do everything we can to keep it safe. Yeah, but this is the traditional method for doing this. We call this plaster jacketing. And uh, it's been going on like this since what the 1870s, 1880s. Yeah, you know, in some ways, you know, in some ways we've you know adopted new technologies like CT skinning or whatever. Yeah. In some ways, we're incredibly old school. Yeah. Uh, which I kind of like. Kinda I mean, like. it's hard to improve on a method like this. Yeah. It just works. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've heard other people try and propose alternatives to jacketing, like using spray crete or something like yeah. that, or but. Some people have tried using foam for support jackets, but it weathers in weird ways or uh -huh. becomes toxic because it breaks down or whatever the heck. It's just like plaster works awesome. Yeah, and it's uh, cheap and 
Who invented Easy it? Was it like the Romans or the Minoans or something? I mean, plaster is a very old technology. I think it might be ancient Greece, like wow. plaster of Paris, gypsum yeah. like that. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Somebody in chat would know better than I would. I bet. Yeah. We've got a lot of people watching. It's, a, it's an old. It's an old. It's an oldie but a goodie. It's, yeah. You know, sometimes the old technologies are the best way to do things. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, if anybody else has got any questions, do not be shy. I'm looking at the chat, and uh, I want to answer yeah, this, your questions. This matrix is amazing. You just brush away the paintbrush, literally. Look at that. It just <laughs> blows up. Somebody was asking earlier, why don't you just use your hands for that? But you It's know, tough on your hands. Is, yeah. Uh, you, you can. Sure, you can. But it's going gonna, it's gonna to chew up your nails and chew up your... Uh, yeah. My hands up. are looking rough right now. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you, for a little... I mean, we do kind of pick off bits with our hands, but, mm -hmm. like, it'll... It'll kind of destroy your hands pretty quick if you do this all day. Also, a brush is just much better for removing the dust that, you know, your fingers are too large for that kind of thing. The little yeah. bristles on that pick up all that dust. It's also more delicate. You can just, like, you yeah, know, go absolutely. very, very soft and very... Uh, oops, okay, here I might use my hands kind of blow a little piece out there. Yeah. You can see how dark this matrix is. Really a lot of organic material, yeah. this mudstone. So we were thinking this might be the bottom of an ancient lake or something. And, and uh, you know, here it's a... Kind of exposed for the first time in 73 million years. These yeah. little rocks here, mudstone. Uh, oh, apparently gypsum plastering goes back to ancient Egypt. Wow. Okay. Thank you, there Jody you Fish. Interesting. Yeah. So. Current one live stream wants to know how much do you guys get paid for this? <laughs> we don't. <laughs> um, or maybe I do, but it's entirely through streaming like this. So, it's only thanks to viewer support that I'm able to do this in the first place. Um, this is how I make my living with streaming, actually. So it's really cool that. I can stream from the field, but we're not getting paid for this. Nobody is getting paid for this. This is entirely a volunteer basis because we've got a pretty small budget. In fact, our budget is basically what uh, what viewers contributed to the fundraiser um, a few weeks ago. So, uh, yeah, we do this because we're passionate about it. We do it because we're drawn to it. We feel a duty to you know, try and figure out what was going on in these ancient ecosystems. Our, our camp supplies include things like raw men and, like, you know... <laughs> You know, cheap beer, cheap light beer, and stuff like that. It's yep. not like it's not like we're all <laughs> champagne back in camp. Well, well, actually, we did have <laughs> last night. We did have a few bottles. We did have of cheap a few champagne, bottles because we which is really nice. Thing. Yeah, uh, but it's not like not like champagne and caviar every night. <laughs> Definitely not. No, shoot, you should see our bathroom facilities. They're uh, they're pretty Spartan. It's a bucket with a little lid on the top. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah, yeah, we've got a number of volunteers who are kind of trickling in and trickling out over the next few weeks. Um, we got a bunch of new people last night. There's some people leaving today. And uh, yeah, yeah, but people drive up in their own vehicles and they, see, they supply their own tent. You know, it's a, digging it's, tools are provided, but it's, you know. It's a, it's a labor of love, you know. Yeah. There's not a lot of money to be made in this stuff, so. Yeah. Um, let's see, let me look at some other questions. Uh, and oh, which institutions do we work for, and where do the findings get published? Well, it's it's going to be an eclectic answer. Um, yeah, yeah. Nick, you want to talk about your home institution? I work at the University of Bath in Bath, England. So I'm a senior lecturer there, and that, that's kind of how I get paid. I get paid to do teaching and do research, and so I have a fair amount of latitude in terms of what I do yep. in terms of research. So that's, I guess, in theory, I'm on the job out here, but. Got some there. Hey, Ethan. I saw beautiful. Awesome. All right, cool. Excellent. Okay. Nice, nice, nice. Uh huh. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. So we'll be able to top track at this thing. Yeah, in just a little bit. Awesome. Thanks for the heads up. Not yet, but we're working real ginger... Or I should say Nick is working real gingerly and slowly. I'm actually streaming right now. <laughs> All right, thanks, Ethan. See you in a few. Bye. All right, nice. Yeah, he'll be here in about 10 minutes. And uh, he's got a saw for us and a new shovel and some other stuff. So. Ooh, a new shovel. Yeah, yeah. Um, but with the funds that, uh, that you good people provided. So thank you, thank you. Putting it to good use. Um, sorry, I interrupted you with that. Um, but yeah, University of Bath, pretty cool. That's it's a long way from there. Yeah. So, uh, but yeah, you were here for the the mid, uh, not mid Mesozoic, 
the Mesozoic Terrestrial Ecosystems Conference yeah, down yeah. in Utah earlier. Yeah. Yeah. Did you think that you were going to be out here? Were you talking to Ethan in advance? or did No, just no, I just ran into from... him on a field trip. He mentioned he was doing this. I'd, I'd heard a bit about what he was doing out here. And I was like, uh-huh. oh, almond formation, that'd be super cool. Because, you know, year, years ago, I kind of drive, drove out here for just a day and kind of poked around, didn't see anything. But I <laughs> I had kind of, it was on my radar as a site where you might potentially get new species and not a lot had been done. So I was pretty stoked to kind of come out here <laughs> and just kind of take a look at it myself. And, and then we ran into this dinosaur. So, uh... Yeah, just kind of like, I don't know. <laughs> if you hadn't found this on the first day, do you think you would have taken off earlier? Maybe, I don't know. I, mean, I don't know. I don't mind. You know, it would have been fun to dig that hadrosaur, too. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I like doing this. I like doing the... I do a little bit of fossil prep back in the lab and myself, and it's kind of... Again, it's, it's very soothing. It's very relaxing. I find a lot of the other stuff you do as, a, as an academic is quite stressful and stress-inducing, mm. and chipping away at bones in the, in the lab can be very soothing. It's... Uh, I think it's like the, one of the most reliable ways I've found to get this flow state. Mm-hmm. Is yeah. You start prepping and you can kind of get in there and just six hours can go by and it just feels <laughs> like time just sort of disappears uh-huh. as you kind of get into this. And again, I, I have this theory that as as tool using primates, we've just evolved to be able to spend huge amounts of time <laughs> focused on just chipping away at rock. I mean, so many different hobbies that people do for fun, I think would reflect that idea. Yeah. You know, whether it's woodworking or sewing or... You know, crochet, Getting, whatever. Yeah, yeah. yeah, gardening, possibly. We're, like we're, we're meant to be tool users. We evolved to make things, and <laughs> unfortunately, a lot of the jobs these days don't allow us to exercise that that right. instinct. Yeah, uh, that's actually a really interesting idea. Like, I it would be cool to see a study of like job satisfaction and if that correlates to really hands-on stuff. Yeah, tool use. Yeah. Um, Buffalo Safari wants to know: Will this find generate a research paper? Probably multiple. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, hopefully. I mean, we we got to get it all prepped out to sort of mm-hmm. know what we have here. But then that would be kind of the, the what? Yeah, what's the uh, the course of events here? We got a top jacket on this. Get this thing back in lab. Get it prepared out. Get the bones kind of consolidated and cleaned, photographed, and then yeah, write up a paper and potentially name a new species. Mm-hmm. So that could be a number of years after this. Hopefully, it'll be sooner than that. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, we're trying to streamline the process as much as possible, but. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I've found things, you know, 10, 11, 12 years ago that are still not published. So sometimes there's a lot of lead time. Occasionally it's decades, yeah, you know? Yeah, some stuff will languish in collections for 100 years or more. I mean, I, yeah. I currently have a paper in review and we're, we are, uh, we're publishing on some material originally collected by Marsh's guys back in the late 1800s. Yeah, And it's yeah. just kind of sat in collections unidentified for more than a century. Mm-hmm. There's still jackets that are from way back then. Like, Cope and Marsh collected these things that still haven't yeah. been opened. Yeah. Yeah. And, and apparently, like, Barnum Brown was out here and collected some stuff that's never... Yeah. It's sitting in jackets somewhere, hopefully somewhere in a museum or a storage mm-hmm. facility, but we don't know where it is, so it's like, it's never been researched, so... So, since we're digging out here right now, I mean, that kind of... That could impel us to <laughs> to try and track those things down, and... Because it's, you know, if we can figure out where those were actually dug up, we can put them into their proper stratigraphic context and yeah. be useful information for trying to figure out the almond formation. There's, there's some big crates in the American Museum of Natural History collections that could conceivably contain this stuff. I don't know. I didn't, didn't occur to me to look at them, but mm-hmm. but it really is. I mean, the part of paleo- for me, the part of paleontology that's most like Indiana Jones, or, <laughs> or the part of Indiana Jones that's most like uh, paleontology, is the very end of Raiders of the Lost Ark. <laughs> Where's the warehouse? Giant warehouse yeah. full of boxes that nobody's <laughs> opened, uh-huh. and there's so many things lurking in museum collections that people collected never got around to figuring out what the heck they were. They just kind of got lost or misidentified. You can spend, you can spend a whole career, and I've spent a large chunk of my career just going through museum collections trying to re-identify stuff. And I mean, just just the other day, I was in uh, down in uh, Brigham Young University going through their collections and ran across a new dinosaur species. <laughs> it had been misidentified as something else. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of work to be done in collections as well. I mean, it's all important. I mean, obviously, you can't do any collections work if nobody collects stuff in the first place. Mm-hmm. But then you kind of got to got to get it prepped up and, and researched as well. Uh, Mild Mo wants to know, uh, how do we know that this is a dinosaur already? Well, we've we've seen the bones on the other side. Um, yeah, very very distinctive texture on Ceratopsian. So not only do we know that this is a dinosaur, but we know what group of dinosaurs it belongs to. Like. Nick and I have seen enough Ceratopsian dinosaur bone to be able to recognize that texture anywhere. Uh, it's very kind of veiny. You've got these kind of like little channels carved out of it. Those that have been blood vessel grooves for supplying uh, the skin and keratin on the frill uh, with nutrients so that it can grow. Think about like the 
you know, the beak of a toucan or something like that. This big keratin sheath, really brightly colored. You know, that's maybe a good analogy for uh, for this kind of dinosaur and its frill. And the underlying bone looks very, very similar on a toucan to uh, to something like this. So yeah. Yeah, it's kind of crazy that a lot of dinosaurs have a fairly distinctive texture to the surface of their bones. Mm -hmm. It won't like get you down to species or anything, but you know, theropod bone is very, very shiny and dense. It's almost like a ceramic or porcelain or something. Mm -hmm. uh, ceratopsid bone tends to be really gnarly and rugose and has these, at least on the frill, has these passages for veins. Uh, hadrosaur bone has a slightly different texture. Mosasaur bone kind of looks like wood for some reason, like all the huh. Oh, it has these long parallels. Cool. I've never dug a mosasaur before. That's neat. It's a very distinctive texture. Uh -huh. And uh, and pterosaur bone has its own texture. Yeah, extremely and thin too. So you can, I mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you can you can kind of identify what you have at least. Literally a few scraps of the surface, you can kind of get down to maybe okay, we maybe have this family of dinosaur. Yep. Uh, so you know, if you've got a chunk of theropod, shiny bone, it's big, probably tyrannosaur. Mm -hmm. Shiny bone, it's small, maybe an orthomimosaur. So it's surprising how much you can infer. Uh, yeah, based on really limited material. Very limited material. I just learned yeah. this by hanging out with the guys up at the Tyrell Museum back when mm -hmm. I was doing my, my PhD. Uh, there's just kind of a lot of little, like, just kind of wisdom and little lessons like that you learn from hanging out with the guys in the field, and then you can kind of, like, you know, wander around, find something like this, and it's like, oh, <laughs> ceratopsian. Yeah. <laughs> Be able to tell the difference between Triceratops ossified tendon and Edmontosaurus ossified tendon oh, okay. by the uh, texture and really? shape and everything. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. They're pretty distinct. Yeah. Ethan's calling me again. Hey, Ethan. Uh, I do see you, yeah. Yeah. Perfect. All right, sounds good. Um, I'll be down there in a little bit to go get that, I guess. Uh, I think we're good on plaster. I think we're good on burlap. Uh, the saw is going to be a lifesaver, so thank you for picking that up. All right. Thanks, Ethan. Bye. All right. So I will have to probably end the stream before I go do that. So maybe we'll do that in a few minutes. Um, but yeah, yeah. And again, it's not just looking at the texture of the bone and the shape and stuff like that. Um, when we go out and collect dinosaurs like this, we're very, very cognizant of the geology. So... You know, if if we're in the wrong geological layers, if we're looking at the wrong rocks, we're not going to find any dinosaurs in there. Um, that's what it's all about. It's all about the context. You got to pay attention to the geology. Because um, yeah, even looking at this landscape here, if you go down into those white beds down there, all that kind of whiter stuff, that was the shoot. What was it called again? Erickson sandstone. Uh, Erickson sandstone, or was that the one that overlies it? I forget. I think the Erickson is below, yeah, yeah. yeah. Is it the Lewis Shale above? I think the Lewis, yeah. I think the Lewis Shale is equivalent to like the Bear Paw Shale. It's, it's hard or to something keep these like things that. straight, yes, if you get yeah. it wondering. Like, I mean, the time period is like, <laughs> when the heck is the Hauteravian exactly? Like, I mean, <laughs> I worked a lot in the campaign in Maastrichtian, so I remember yeah. those, but like, some of those other periods. Uh... We don't have a dedicated geologist on, st uh, on the crew here or or else maybe we would have a, a better handle on that. It's just, it's hard to remember all this but, information. But this is kind of, kind of an interesting thing here is we've got this ceratopsid and it's in a mudstone and that's yeah. very, very common. Like, yeah. you know, the most common dinosaur in the mudstones are these ceratopsians. And then the, the, then with the duckbills, their most common setting is, is, is sandstones. We've got a couple duckbill skeletons here that are in sandstones. So they're like, you know, this is a pattern we see in Dinosaur Park or the Hell Creek where you know, for some reason, lots of ceratopsy in the mudstone deposits, lots of duckbills and sandstones we're seeing out here, too. I think I read a paper about that that you wrote, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, like, with the Hell Creek in particular, I want to yeah. say. and we, we didn't really, I don't know, I, I maybe duckbills like hanging out near rivers, it's preferred habitat, maybe they swam a lot, whatever. It's, hmm. it's not entirely clear why that is, but there are, oh. you get very different pictures of the dinosaur community, depending on whether you're sampling in sandstones or mudstones. Hey, Ethan. Hello? Did he butt dial me? Yeah, he butt dialed. Oh, hey. Yeah, I can check it on them for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. Did you put it on the opposite side from the road so people can't see? Perfect. All right. Awesome. Thanks, Ethan. Okay, you too. Bye. <laughs> I 
is how we communicate at uh, you know different sites in the field. Um, yeah, I've, I'm glad the Starlink is running because if it weren't, I would not have reception here. So yeah, running off the Wi-Fi. Um, but yeah, yeah. Shoot, what were we talking about? Oh yeah, I was talking about the geology too. If you're to look down there in the Erickson sandstone, it's very unlikely that you're going to find any dinosaur fossils at all. Um, because that is, I believe that's marine, isn't it? I don't know. It looks pretty fluvial to me, but yeah. it's just like, why you get dinosaurs where you get dinosaurs, not other places? I don't know. Because uh -huh. sometimes you'll go to a, a, sometimes you'll go to an environment. It looks perfect, and there's just nothing there. Right. That's kind of like the Fox Hills formation that underlies the Hell Creek. Yeah. Like, you do occasionally knock into dinosaurs there, but yeah. it's very, very rare. Um, I mean, they must have lived everywhere. I don't think yeah. there's places like the dinosaurs just didn't go there. But something about like. You know, the chemistry of the groundwater or whatever, mm -hmm. or the, the weathering processes, maybe destroying fossils or whatever. It's actually kind of a big unknown. Why do we get dinosaurs? Tons of dinosaurs in certain areas. Yep. And other areas that seem, at least on the surface, they look really good. There's just nothing in them, <laughs> in those rocks. And I ha I don't really know, like, I mean, you know, again, maybe maybe a geologist will tell me I'm, I, I'm totally wrong, but like, the Erickson looks like these fluvial deposits, uh -huh. but there's just nothing in it. Yeah. Uh, you know, yeah, why is there no dinosaur in there? I wonder how fine it is. Could it just be that the, the particles are too small, there's not enough energy to transport bone into it, or? There's some fairly, you know, fairly sizable sand grains, and they're almost huh. almost approaching, like, you know, you know, short of gravel, but, like, uh -huh. you know, it almost kind of looks almost conglomeratic in places. So very coarse layers, finer layers, kind of everything in between. You know, it doesn't look to me like, you know, there's, you know, but we, we get similar stuff up above where we're getting dinosaurs, uh, I, yeah, I, I have no idea. And then I, was, I was kind of stomping around this morning, hmm. uh, looking at some almond formation exposure. Very similar to what we're seeing here. I didn't see a scrap of bone in an hour of walking around. So, wow. you know, it's it's just very localized. Uh, dinosaur bone is not randomly distributed. Mm -hmm. And so you're prospecting. If you find one bone, that's telling you that's a little signal. Even if it's a scrap of bone, completely <laughs> worthless, something on a ground up chunk of bone, it says something about this environment is conducive to preserving bone and there's likely to be other stuff in the area yeah so they're not evenly spaced they tend to cluster and so that was part of the reason why i was kind of hunting around here because you guys were digging out that bone or uh, that other bone mm -hmm. I'm like well there's bone here maybe there's more bone and so we just kind of stomped around until we found this thing <laughs> uh, oh volcano doc is here volcano doc uh she streams volcanology she's a volcanologist okay wow um but yeah, she says it's got to be a preservation condition issue. It, that would make sense. Yeah, it, it, it very well could be. Yeah, uh, you know, a couple of years ago, I was in Africa and just kind of walking around this this uh, margin of this alkali lake, and there's just tons of bone preserved there. Something uh -huh. like the alkali conditions maybe preserve the bone hmm. against being you know dissolved by uh, soil acids or consumed sure. by termites or something. But something about those alkali conditions uh -huh. was very conducive to bone preservation. And so around the margin of that lake is one of the few places where they found like ancient Homo sapiens, huh. uh, one of the oldest mo oldest human skulls, although not necessarily a modern Homo sapiens, but archaic one. And yeah, those alkali lakes seem to preserve things well. <laughs> and maybe there's similar local conditions, you know, chemi chemical conditions in the in the groundwater or in the soil that, you know, just even very locally from you know one stratum to the next or one one valley to the next, you get. Uh, bone in one place not in another uh -huh. uh, it'd be it'd be a great phd project if someone could figure that out and like <laughs> tell us where to go exactly yeah because as it is we just stumble around like <laughs> trial and error and it's just sheer persistence uh, -huh. uh i mean that might be an interesting thing to talk about is how do you find dinosaurs yeah because some people are really good at it <laughs> um and I, I mean, it might seem it might, it might seem amazing that like, oh, I found one on the you know in the first afternoon out here, I found one. I must be good. No, it's like the first afternoon plus the twenty years previously looking. So I it's just uh, <laughs> yeah. sure persistence goes a long way. It really uh, does. Yeah. There, I, I you know you can develop a skill. You can learn to recognize bone. Uh, that does help you learn to recognize the texture. You learn to recognize places to look. Uh, that's kind of a baseline thing. That's yeah. like that's something that, that's. Necessary, but not necessarily yeah. sufficient. I, I think some people have a, a skill verging on magic that they can just like, they're just really good at yeah. it. They almost like an intuition or sixth sense of where bone occurs. Mm -hmm. But even those people are incredibly persistent. Yeah. Uh, you you know, can't I, give up in an area like yeah. this. You can't get discouraged. Yeah, I know yeah. there's some people like Phil Curry would talk about being out in the field. There's certain, certain people he'd make him walk behind him. He's like, well, I want to find something. If you're in front of me, I won't find anything. You'll find it first. <laughs> so he's like, walk behind me. And they would like find things in his footprints, literally, yeah. almost literally. So some people have almost this sixth sense, but even those people 
one thing that kind of characterizes those people who just seem to have this magical ability is they're incredibly tenacious. Yeah. So being persever uh, perseverance will goes a long way in finding dinosaurs, as it does in almost everything in life. Just grinding away at it. Mm -hmm. uh, you know. The more time you spend doing it, yeah. the more likely it is that you'll actually succeed. Yeah. Because um, you're learning things along the way too, and I don't know. Uh, I've always said that if you're not stopping and picking up random bits of things every, you know, few dozen paces, you're really not looking hard enough. Like, you should have a lot of false positives. Yeah. You know, just picking up bizarre things and looking at the texture and trying to figure out, is this bone, is it not? Because it's, it could be really easy when you're out here for, you know, to, to kind of get discouraged and just kind of walk without really looking hard, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. Who was that guy? There's some, some basketball player or something, and he said this saying that I really love, and he says... He says, hard work beats talent when talent doesn't work hard. Yeah, and yeah. It, it's like, it, it's hard work out here. It might seem like fun. Like, oh, I stumble around, I find dinosaur. It's like, and yeah, it is fun, but it's like, you know, to have that moment of fun where it's like, it's a lot of hard work. It's a lot of false positives. It's a lot of mm -hmm. barren ground. It's like, it's just going out here and hammering the ground and not giving up. Yeah. And other people have been out here in the almond formation before and haven't, haven't found, found this thing. They, yeah. They, uh, I mean, maybe they're looking the wrong place. They gave up too soon or whatever. And. And Barnum Brown might have was out in this area. He might have mm -hmm. walked past this place, and he kind of was like, "Yeah, well, I've, I've got enough out of the almond formation. I'm going off to Texas or whatever the heck." <laughs> and uh, so it's just uh, you know, kind of having the persistence of this team being out here and just hitting the ground over a number of years. Uh, persistence goes a long way in paleontology, as it does in most things in life. <laughs> Rocky Elter says it's a mentally taxing occupation. I imagine lots of fatigue when you're out there uh, in the elements for an extended period of time. I mean. Yeah, during certain times, yes. We've been pretty lucky in that it's not been blazingly hot out here. Um, the wind hasn't been maddening or anything. Like, there is crazy, crazy weather that comes through this region, and we've been pretty lucky in that it it hasn't really hit us yet. Yeah, We are incredibly tough, yes. <laughs> I wouldn't say mentally taxing, necessarily, uh, but it's taxing. It, 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 yeah. it takes, you know, it's kind of like... Maybe mentally taxing in the sense of having the perfect perseverance and not giving up when you're tired and dehydrated and mm -hmm. cold and getting rained on is like it's mentally taxing in that way, but not mentally taxing the way, say, doing your taxes would be or, or, <laughs> or coding an R or something like that. Sure, yeah. Uh, you know, statistics I find mentally taxing, uh, but this requires like it's kind of like almost morally taxing, like morale is hmm. just kind of getting in there and, and not giving up is kind of the hard part. And morale's been excellent for us so far. Holy yeah. moly. Yeah. Uh, because we've been so lucky and yeah it, it doesn't hurt when you found a dinosaur yeah that that, <laughs> that that does a lot for morale but i think in a group like this or almost any type of teamwork morale is one of the most important things is trying to keep everybody's spirits up yep uh so i, I do a lot of like group papers and a big part of the papers just kind of come on team we can do it you know the heck with those darn reviewers we're gonna get this paper published and just kind of keeping your spirits up and keeping on moving forward is and it can be tough sometimes i think we also forget how, I don't know, this sort of work selects for people who are comfortable sleeping in a tent for weeks on end, you know, yeah, on the ground, you know, you, you, we get sand in our food and stuff like that, and we have to poop in a bucket. It tastes and... great, the sand. I love the sand. <laughs> no, of course not. But... It's, so this sort of thing isn't for everybody, for sure. Um, yeah, there are many people watching right now who are probably mortified by that, uh, you know, those kinds of conditions, but, you know, we thrive out here. This is what it's all about. And, uh, yeah, yeah, I don't know. I, so maybe there's some selection bias there, too. Yeah. <laughs> I know, but, like, we, we evolved in the Kalahari Desert, man. Like, you know, in the, in the Kalahari and the Botswana, and that's where the, probably the cradle of humanity. We're meant to live out in the Badlands, I think. <laughs> I don't know. In small, small I think a lot of people would disagree. Little... I mean, I'm very comfortable out here, and I, I'd be inclined to agree, but I, shoot. I, I've been to those hunter-gatherer camps, and it looks a lot like our camp back there, these little, like, little huts and kind of mm -hmm. gathered campfire. It's very similar. I, I don't know. I find some of my happiest times have been in, in the field work. Me too. It's a small group of for people. Sure. It's, it's, very, it's very socially around the same group of people day in, day out. You're yeah. kind of... You come up with your stupid in jokes, and you kind of get to know everybody, and yep. it's kind of like you're all working for a, a common in, purpose. Yeah, common purpose. That's yeah. a really neat thing, and and often in work, or you know, sometimes in academia or whatever, everybody's kind of got their own agenda, doing their yeah. own thing. And it's it's neat being in something where you're all kind of working together and help each other. It's really psychologically very fulfilling, and so I find 
yeah, some of my happiest times in my life have been out in the field without all these creature comforts. So mm -hmm. it's like, you know, the material stuff, yeah, I mean, we don't necessarily, like, I, you know, had some great times in Alberta, you know, living in this mouse-infested house. <laughs> and it just, it was like, it was just, it was awesome. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, I think the teamwork aspect is a huge part of it also, like, because everybody's got their own abilities and everybody's got their own, you know, shortcomings and everything. And once you kind of get to know everybody and you can kind of put certain people on certain tasks and things just go really, really smoothly, it's, that's a wonderful feeling when your crew is just like a well-oiled machine, you know? Um, like, <laughs> from each according to their, to their ability to each according to their need. Um, that sort of thing is just how it works out here. And that's, that's wonderful when you just kind of gel with your crew. Uh... It's a special feeling for sure. Yeah. Uh, speaking of special stuff, we've got a, a big raid from Al Hazred. Welcome, Al Hazred and Raiders. Uh, what were you working on? How are you doing? Welcome to the late Cretaceous Almond Formation of Western Wyoming. We're here digging up what will almost certainly be a new species or genus of ceratopsian dinosaur, horned dinosaur. You, you, everybody knows and loves Triceratops. This is about 7 million years older than Triceratops, and. Uh, yeah, we're really excited to see what it looks like after we get this thing back to the lab and get it cleaned. Um, but before we do that, you, you got to get it out of the ground. That's what we've been doing for the past uh, past few days. So yeah, exciting, exciting stuff. But uh, yeah, and I guess Happy Father's Day too. I completely forgot. Shoot, I got to call up my dad later. But uh, yeah, yeah. And let's see, going through chat. Oh, Iacane's here. How you doing, Iacane? Welcome, welcome. Uh, tell me, is the lens... Are you picking up the dirt on the lens, everybody? I might have to clean that. I think we got a raindrop on there, too. I've got some lens wipes, but if it's tolerable, we'll just leave it for now. Yeah. But uh, Age of Music says, how do you know it's in the ground? Well, it's not anymore. It's in a protective jacket. But Nick found this in the ground right there. This is the hole that it came out of. And, uh... That's where it sat for 73 million years. And uh, we trenched around it. Uh, we covered it up. We made a top jacket. And then just a little while ago, we flipped this sucker over. And uh, now Nick is continuing to kind of pare down, remove the rock from this to make it lighter and easier to carry. And then soon we will put uh, another jacket, oh, another bit of the jacket over the top. So we'll basically put a lid over this. This is burlap that is soaked in plaster of Paris to make kind of a protective cocoon, something that we call a field jacket. And this is how it's done. This is how dinosaur paleontologists have been doing this since the 1880s. Um, it's a tried and true method and uh, yeah. Honestly, I, I find it to be a lot of fun too. I really enjoy making jackets. There's a certain feeling of you know pride of accomplishment when you make a really beautiful jacket because you know that you're gonna get this thing safely back to the lab and uh yeah yeah like we were saying this thing's 73 million years old we got to make sure that it survives the next couple weeks before it gets into the laboratory yeah pretty cool uh but yeah and Nell says was the crest attached to anything you mean the frill well yeah it's it's part of the cert oh you're asking about was it in articulation with any of the other bones no, this one was isolated right here. But there's a piece that kind of looks like a skimosal coming in, out over here, so we might yeah. have more stuff going into the ground. I mean, <clears throat> I mean, given it's just articulated, it's quite likely some pieces are missing, but it's conceivable mm -hmm. we get back in there and find the whole skull or the whole skeleton. Uh, of course, if we do, we'll have to knock down the entire hill. But like, yeah, we need definitely need a permit for that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and these rocks would be an interesting challenge yeah, to try and get rid of, yeah. but. Uh, that's a bridge that we'll cross when we get to it. Yeah. For now, we've got the most important part of the animal here, the most diagnostic bit, the uh, the parietal bone of the frill. Possibly parts of two parietals in here, right? Could be both pair, like... Uh... I, uh, the parietals are fused, so typically it would be a single element, uh -huh. and... So I you think, think this is just one parietal, then, most likely? They, they fuse very early in ontogeny, so there would just be one bone formed mm -hmm. of the fused parietals. Um, how much we have... I count maybe four or five epoxyphenols, uh -huh. and then maybe those two. are the little like triangular bones, kind of yeah, spiky guys yeah. around the margin. Yeah, and then maybe a couple, uh, a fragment that had a couple more. So 
Typically, these guys have six epoxipitals. Uh, they can go up to me 12 in Taurosaurus. But it suggests we probably have at least half the frill here, half the back of the frill, uh, and maybe even almost all the frill. Uh, it's going to really depend on, you know, you know we, we don't really know how many hornlets this guy had in the back of the skull. So, you know, we could have most of it or just half of it. But hmm. if we have the right, if we have half of it, we can kind of mirror the other and kind of figure out what we've got. Yeah. So we only need to get half the parietal bone, not the whole thing, to get a pretty good idea of what we have. Pretty neat. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, we've still have to talk to, well, we've got to figure out if we can dig in further to try and follow those other bones in. We're kind of at the limit for how dip, uh, how big a hole we can dig right now under a prospecting permit. But, uh, yeah, yeah. We've got a good relationship with the uh, Bureau of Land Management. This is all your federal public lands out here, everybody. If you're an American taxpayer, then, uh, yeah, your tax dollars go toward protecting this and keeping it open to the public. And, uh, yeah, and this belongs to you. Yeah. What's that? You know, sticking it up, you know, getting in the permits. The yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, yeah, you know, go into a public institution and mm -hmm. be accessible to researchers and hopefully visible to the public at some yeah. point. So, like we always say on this channel, that belongs in a museum. You know, this this is definitely going to a museum. We've got a deal worked out with a museum in Ohio where they're going to be repositing this, and uh, they've been they've been excellent. So, uh, yeah, that's the cool thing about digging up a dinosaur like this as a paleontologist is, you know, it's not for fortune and glory. It's for science and it's a wonderful feeling knowing that this thing that we're digging up right now that we're pouring blood sweat and tears into this is going to outlive all of us like i will be long dead and in the ground and this thing will be in a museum long into the future maybe a bit of glory not a lot of fortune <laughs> fair absolutely yeah yeah i guess maybe the live streaming thing here would maybe fall under the glory category but uh hundreds yeah. of viewers <laughs> <laughs> no kidding, we've got 391 right now, okay, according to the counter. Cow. And this updates every, like, 10 minutes or so, okay. so it's a good chance we're oh. well above 400. Yeah, pretty excellent. Yeah. But there's probably a lot more people would be watching this if I was playing Minecraft or something. <laughs> no, I don't... You go to the Minecraft category, there's probably... That's the thing on Twitch, is that, like, uh, the vast majority of people who stream on Twitch are streaming to one or fewer people. Really? Okay. Yeah, it's like... So we're like Twitch famous or something. No, I mean, this is... We might even be at the top of the travel and outdoor category right now. Somebody tell me if, if we are. But, uh... Okay, well... Yeah, yeah. I, I won't let the fame go to my head. <laughs> All the people who helped me along the way, I... You know. But, yeah, yeah. Um, oh, and thank you, Claire, for uh, telling everybody to get the word out about this channel. Yeah, yeah. This is... Uh, not to toot my own horn or anything, but this is unique. You know, a live dinosaur dig on Twitch. This has never been done before. So I'm, I'm really excited to be able to, to share this with all of you. It's such a privilege to be able to show you what it's yeah. like to dig up dinosaurs in the field. And it's not just this being streamed on this. It's not like, you know, this has never been done before in terms of somebody digging up a chunk of this. Exactly. This, this is a brand new dinosaur right yeah, here. Yeah, like so you're, never been done before. you're actually witnessing all history. No, no joke. No yeah. exaggeration. Yeah. Yeah. Um... I, th I can only think of maybe a handful of other times when there's been a film crew uh, while they've been digging up a holotype. Um, I heard the BBC went out to the, the Hypsilophodon beds, and they, the paleontologist was like, oh yeah, we're going to dig into these Hypsilophodon beds, there's a uh -huh. lot, of, lot of them in there, we're going to find you a dinosaur, and they followed them for like a week or two, just rock, 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 nothing, they went they went away and then they found a Hypsilophodon, uh -huh. so it's like, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's hard, it's a, it's a difficult thing to stage. Uh -huh. uh -huh. Yeah, the, the fossil record is not always cooperative. It doesn't. <laughs> it doesn't follow the, the demands of the director. It's definitely smelling like rain right now, so there is a chance I'll have to wrap this up. Uh, but I don't know. It's weird. The clouds are moving north now. Normally they go uh, west to east. Now they're going south to north. So that very well. That is what I'm smelling. Yeah, that is some serious rain right there, and that looks like it might be heading straight for us. Oh, man. Yeah. Now might actually be a good time to wrap this up, that being said. Um, we might have to tarp this thing over and then jacket it afterward. Um, hopefully I didn't set us back too far, time-wise, by, uh, by streaming. Uh, rather than, like, helping clear this away, but this is looking great. Yeah, it's looking really good, you know, slow, you know, just slow and steady. Uh, I think we could probably top-jacket it now, but, like... Uh, yeah. 
Um, and I've, I've jacketed things in the rain. Like, it's not it's not impossible. But uh, It'll be safe under the tarp. It's like, I mean, I found the site and I can hardly find it when I'm out there wandering around. I was like, where is that dinosaur? So it's not like I'm going to be able to discover it, yeah. I suspect. Uh, it'll be pretty safe up here under the tarp. <laughs> well, I think, with that being said, let me see who we can do a raid into right now. Who else is live? Hopefully doing some science. Always trying to spread the science love. And... There we go. Back to there. Bob Ross is streaming right now. Really? <laughs> There's a Bob Ross channel where they just play B B Bob Ross reruns oh, okay, okay. Uh, every weekend. Yeah. Gets a lot of viewers. Um, let's you see. Like, kind of like Bob Ross with like a little paintbrush. You know? <laughs> Happy little Ceratops, you know. <laughs> yeah, let's... Uh, you know what? Let's go right into Bob Ross. Why not? That should... Uh, He's awesome. I think that would his be cool. His enthusiasm, his passion, it's, it's wonderful. Yeah. Not enough people are earnestly and passionately interested in what they're doing. Agreed. The world would be a much better place if if more people were able to that, do what they're passionate about. The sincerity of him is, I think, one of the things that really attracts people to what he does. Agreed. Yeah. Let's see... Raid Bob Ross. Gosh, shoot. Ruts. There we go. Ruts. Uh, oh, targeting... We, I guess they don't allow raids in the Bob Ross channel, so let's go raid into... Who's doing some science? Um, or maybe we'll go raid into Kinara. Um, that's always a good time. She's uh, doing some cooking right now. Uh, Father's Day stream, making some popcorn or something. That doesn't sound the most... Popcorn hot dogs? What is that? Okay. We're gonna go find out. Mm -hmm. Raid. Canara. There we go. Excellent. I gotta pull this up on the other app. Hang tight, everybody. All right. Well, thank you everybody for watching, and thank you for your support. Holy cow! We would not have all the wonderful things we have in camp, like food and uh, and everything else, if it were or, not or for your dinosaur. support. Or this dinosaur potentially. <laughs> yeah. I mean, holy cow, we would have maybe tried to make this work, but it would have been a whole lot more difficult if we didn't have any money. So thank you for making this possible, everybody. Holy cow. Um, and I'll stream again the next time I can. But we're going to get a lid on this thing and make sure it's, uh, it's nice and protected before that rain hits us. So let's go ahead and raid into Kanara right now. I'll see everybody later. Take care.